something that they consider extreme, such as, oh, I don't know, maybe an Olympic athlete showing pride in old glory for once. If that sounds eerily familiar, it's because China has been doing it for years. The Chinese government monitors what their citizens do on social media every day. It's a social credit system. If you say the right things about the Chinese Communist Party, you get social credit points. If you say the wrong thing, you get those points taken away. And if you lose enough points, the government starts to take away some of your freedoms and liberties. If that sounds like something out of a dystopian novel, guess what? It's happening in China right now, and now our government is considering doing the very same thing here. Well, guess what? I've got news. Not on our watch. At First Liberty Institute, we don't sit on the sidelines and lament America's dissent and demise. I told you earlier that I'm here from the front lines to report on what's happening. And that's because First Liberty is on those front lines every day, fighting and winning. We win a lot. In fact, for over 20 years, our win rate has been higher than 90%. And we don't get tired of winning. Now that record only stands to improve with the incredible judges that were confirmed during the Trump administration. These are some of the most brilliant minds in the legal profession, and they are committed, they're just as committed to defending the Constitution as you and I. But there's another threat I have to warn you about. The radical left also knows how effective President Trump was at rebalancing our judiciary. They also they also know that they can't remove those judges because they have lifetime tenure. So the left says if they can't beat them, they're simply gonna outnumber them. As I stand here today, the radical left is pouring tens of millions of dollars into its effort to pack our courts from the Supreme Court on down through our lower courts. Now, let's just call it what it is. Whenever somebody tries to overthrow a branch of the government, you call it a coup. And if the left gets its way with this coup, our constitutional republic as we know it is gone. But as I said, not on our watch. First Liberty is doing something about it. We are exposing the radical left's coup attempt, and I invite every single one of you to join us. All you have to do is visit firstliberty.org or supremecoup.com to add your voice to the tens of thousands of Americans who stand with us in defending religious freedom for all Americans. I mentioned at the beginning that some of my friends warned me that speaking here today at CPAC might get me canceled or even kicked out of the military. Well, if they're gonna discharge me, then so be it. Just as long as my discharge papers say why I was kicked out. Thank you, God bless America, and God bless Texas. This corridor is more than an energy project. It's an attack the weak against the strong. Freedom of speech is under attack. Who is Antifa? And what do they want? In here, no one tells us what to think. Welcome to Fox Nation's CPAC All Access Live. This is Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. Give it to right. God. He is doing this for a reason. This is one sick person. There is a way to find justice. Absolutely beautiful. And it all leads to this. At home with me, Paula Dean. The future for all freedom-loving people. I think the best way you can thank me for being a veteran is be a good American. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall.
America's built it based on liberties and freedoms. Liberty HealthShare brings that to healthcare. The liberty of choosing your own doctor. The liberty of choosing your own hospital. Liberty HealthShare makes healthcare affordable to millions of Americans. Ignite your liberty. Starting at $199 for a single, $299 a month for couples, and $399 a month for the family. Learn how you can save. Go to libertyhealthshare.org today. That's libertyhealthshare.org. Ladies and gentlemen, this is America in Crisis. How conservative policy solutions and values can bring people together. Please welcome your host, from The Ben Ferguson Show, Ben Ferguson. Oh, it's nice to be in Texas, my friends. How are you? I need a little more than that. We're not in California. Come on. That's what I like to hear. It's like coming home for me. I got to go see my old house today. I got to eat at a restaurant that I hadn't seen in forever. And then I get to hang out with some great conservatives like you. It's not a bad day at the office for me. I can tell you that much. So let me tell you what we're going to be doing. You're going to be, this is going to be rapid fire and it's going to be a blast. We are gonna talk about four major issues that I think all of you would agree with me on are gonna be extremely important, especially with the midterm elections coming up. My list, number one, immigration. You can, kind of an important issue right now. Number two, energy. Then we're gonna deal with the Second Amendment and big tech. So you guys, here we go. So first up is gonna join me, Representative, State Representative Matt Schaefer, 20 years in the Navy and the Reserves. He's gonna come on out now. Give him a big thank you for serving our country as well. First time on stage I've had another dude wear boots. It's usually I'm the awkward one, I love this. This is nice. So let's talk about immigration for a second. Uh, for people that don't know what's going on, we have an immigration crisis. Uh, I would argue that it's not a crisis to this administration. I would argue this is being done on purpose. I would argue that they absolutely premeditated and preplanned to have an open border policy to flood the United States of America and then send people all over the country. You have been leading on this issue. You've seen how big of a problem this is since 2016. One of the big issues is obviously sanctuary cities. We saw when the vice president landed in Texas, didn't actually even go to the border. You know, it was a great photo op, didn't see the border though. She was sitting there with a congresswoman that said, welcome to the new Ellis Island of the United States of America. We are the capital of the border here. When you hear that, knowing what you guys are dealing with with sanctuary cities, it basically says if you're across the border, come over, we want you run across the border and no one's gonna stop you. The Biden administration turned on the welcome sign. Uh, it's a big light. It's saying not only come, but we will make your life easier. We will help you when you get here. Uh, there's a number of benefits that you'll uh, have access to. Uh, and it is, a, it is a major crisis, it really is. And I do believe it's intentional, uh, as you mentioned. I, I believe that they say an open border to the, to the Democrats means winning elections in the future years because it changes the demographics uh, in a way that it's, it's going to be hard to come back from. Uh, so if you're not from Texas and you're not really familiar with the scope of what's happening, uh, it's really unimaginable just how many people. We had a two-week period recently in Texas. We had over 50,000 people that we apprehended in just a two-week period. Uh, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador are emptying into the state of Texas. And this is a federal responsibility, a Texas problem, but I can tell you if you're from another state, it's going to be your problem too if it's not already. And the drugs and the human trafficking uh, are incredible. Uh, from the state of Texas, we look at the pressure that's going to be put on our foster care system, on our public schools, on our health care system. Well, you know, the left, they all talk about, oh, Texas ranks such and such in, in the number of uninsured. Well, well, are they Texans that are uninsured? Let's talk about just how many Texans, okay? We have thousands upon thousands of people that are flooding across who don't speak the language, who don't have identification, 
uh, and are just being welcomed uh, by the Biden administration. And you, you mentioned drugs, and I want to ask you about this because I had a caller the other day. It was a woman that called in the show, and we were talking about this open border policy, and she said that she buried her grandson. He took some drugs that were laced with fentanyl. Uh, the police said when they made that phone call and were telling them what happened, we're seeing a lot of this right now. We are seeing people that had no intention to OD, that are getting these drugs coming across the border. They think they're just gonna have a good time, as they described it, and get high, and they die. And they said, it's getting worse and worse by the week as we are seeing the open border because there's such a marketplace for this and if you want to try to get your drug there and you need to put something else in it to get it close to what the other drugs are and you don't have it, that's why they start doing this. They're making new type of concoctions. The, the cartels are highly professional in how they do this. They equivalently uh, set up you know, pharmaceutical manufacturing plants down there. They will hire chemical engineers uh, from their universities to, to run these things. Uh, they're doing this on a scale and, and lowering the cost to where they control the market. You know, I live out in rural East Texas, and it used to be that there would be methamphetamines that were, you know, grown out in the out in the woods. Not anymore, because the cartels in Mexico are so good and efficient at producing methamphetamines that they've taken over the market. Uh, they are killing Americans, uh, and you can go just across the river uh, from the Texas border, and there are large, you know, fairly, fairly large cities that are completely ungoverned, no police force. Folks, you need to understand that there are large parts of Mexico that are completely ungoverned by legitimate authorities. The Mexican army, the Mexican police do not have authority in those areas, large parts of the country. And so they have gained operational control of the border, and the Biden administration has abandoned us. Let's, let's deal with what cities do. You know, it's obvious that the federal government's not going to do their job. They're not going to step in. Well, they, I think they say, we are doing our job. We're changing policy. It's an open door, open border, bring it all in policy. What do states have to do? What have we done right in Texas? What should other states that are now dealing with these flights coming in the middle of the night, Marsha Blackburn, for example, senator from Tennessee, finds out through social media, basically, that planes are landing in the middle of the night in Chattanooga, Tennessee, filled with illegal immigrant children. No one from the federal government told them they were coming, and we're seeing this now happen all over the country. So what do other states learn from Texas and what you guys have done? A, a couple of things. I think that uh, our Republican conservative attorney generals need to test the constitutional boundaries on this immigration issue and turn these cases over to these Trump judges. Donald Trump left these great judges for us, and we need to put this issue in front of them and say we can stand up uh, where Washington has failed on that. The second is you have got to pass strong anti-sanctuary city laws. Uh, in 2017, what does that mean? Tell yeah. me what a strong law is. So many people here, how many people are you are out here from outside of Texas? That means, what do they go back yeah, and ask for? What, you, do, what you, do they say, you need to do hey what, state rep, I need you to do X. You need to do what we did in 2017, which says when you've got a, a sheriff uh, in a big city uh, that says, oh, we've got this person uh, in, in jail who's, a, who's an alien, and ICE wants a detainer, and so we're just going to let that person loose, even though they are a violent criminal. We're going to put them out on the street. You pass a law that says if they do that, they will go to jail. And that's what we did in the state of Texas. Last question uh, on this one, and I think it's one that's really important. For us in the midterms, I think it's important that we have compassion for people that are suffering while also explaining very clearly that our laws are laws that are going to be enforced, that we are not going to be a lawless society, community. How do we sell this better than we have to the people? Because I understand people that are suffering, but I also know we're being taken advantage of. Well, I, I agree with that. Uh, every person is made in the image of God. Every person, whether you're from Guatemala or you're from the state of Texas. Uh, and, and we're going to treat people with respect. But, but God is a God of order and not chaos. And we have chaos on the border right now. God is a God of order. But let me tell you about the politics of this. Donald Trump was so racist, apparently, 
that all of these people on the border are now voting Republican in the state of Texas. Look at the counties in Texas that voted Republican, that were Hispanic Democrat areas that are now voting Republican. They uh, saw the crime coming in. They saw the violence. I'm you. They saw the cartels. They, called, they saw the sex trafficking, the human trafficking. They saw the abuse, and they saw the amount of money that these coyotes looked at these individuals, not as human beings. When you pack people in an 18-wheeler, you don't look at them as human beings. You look at them as a dollar sign, and you don't care if they die on the way there or after they get to America. And what about the rights of the people that live along the border, the ranchers, the business owners, uh, the people that have had their property destroyed? Uh, you know, the, the woman who, who will not mow her front yard without a pistol on her belt because she doesn't know if a, a, a gang of MS-13 members are going to come through her property. These are real people. I've talked to them. These are real problems. There are real security concerns. Uh, we do want to trade with Mexico. That's great. We have great relationships there. But this is not about trade or, uh, or jobs even. This is about bringing order to chaos. Rep, I appreciate you coming out here. Give a big round of applause for a man leading on this issue and serving his country. He'll be back out in a few minutes as we talk about guns. Thank you. I told you we're going to be going fast here. Coming up, we're going to deal with energy. I want to introduce Representative Michael Cloud and also Kevin Freeman coming out the stage. I tried to warm it up for you out here, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Which family member was that? Be honest. <laughs> How much did you pay him? Come on. You're going to a good steak dinner tonight. Well, we have the, one of the best districts in Texas, so I, I personally it. think I the best. It. So. All right, so let's talk energy. Uh, <laughs> Texas is, uh, we might have a little bit of energy going on here, uh, pre Biden administration. Uh, I, I want to start with one of the big headlines that has happened nationwide, and that is Keystone Pipeline. They're going to sue the U.S. government for a lot of money for pulling that permit, as they should. You look at gas prices that have skyrocketed. You look at a lot of people that are going to look at this administration and say, is it worth doing anything in any state in America if we know that they're going to start pulling things? So I want to start with you on that from a states' rights issue. Uh, what is the game plan, and how do you fight back against this? As it's very clear, they've said, we're not open for business. If it has anything to do with fossil fuels and it doesn't have alternative energy in front of it, we're going to destroy it. And look at the price of the pump now. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah, exactly. I, I think the first thing we have to realize is that there is an intentional effort to shame us out of Americans, uh, as Americans, out of our strengths. Uh, and, and so you're so, not buying an electric car, is that what you're telling me? Uh, <laughs> so th that's, that's our national history, that's the rule of law, that's our amazing diversity as a nation, and certainly that applies to our natural resources. So there's an attempt to shame us out of our strengths, and, and we've got to stand up to that. And so I've been asking that same question to people in the oil and gas industry. I was at a lunch, and there was a, a dozen people there, and we were talking these very issues, and, and the execs were asking me, they said, how do we get the Biden administration to understand that the policies they're putting in place are going to lead to 4 and $5 a gallon gas for the American people and what that's going to do for energy prices for their families and those things. How do we get them to understand that? And, and when, when I told them, it's like, it's not that they don't understand that. They understand that. That's their goal, and that's what's sad. And I think that's what the energy industry needs to stand up and understand, and certainly the American people need to stand up and understand, is that this is very intentional. This isn't an accident. This isn't uh, some misguided policy. It's misguided I, in the I, sense I remember going, when, but. back, and you go back to the Obama years, and this is a very concise plan. And Kevin, you, you'll remember this when his energy advisor said, we want to see the same prices that they have in Europe. Now, he lied at the time because he referred to it as gallons, five, six, seven dollars a gallon. No, that was liters. You can Google it and see how many liters are in a gallon. We were talking about totally off the charts gas price in America per gallon. It's obvious that they're saying, okay, We'll make it where you are forced into submission to agree with our green energy policy, which is you're going to drive a car that you're going to plug in. 
What's so funny about that is in California, they asked them to stop charging their cars a week ago with their energy crisis out there. So yeah, the chickens are coming home to roost, but you hear it from people, they're stressed. I don't care about the nine cents I saved on the 4th of July barbecue that the White House said, we should be so proud about, 16 cents. Sorry, I should have made sure it's accurate. 16 cents is how much you saved when it's cost me almost double at the pump. Yeah, it's the absolutely pure economic warfare. They're trying to use our system and our money to destroy our economy or to implement their socialist Marxist agenda. There's no other, uh, other way to look at it. You want to drive oil prices high, you know it has implications. It costs people jobs, it creates inflation, it slows down economic growth. It is intentional, it's purposeful, so that they can sweep in with their radical Marxist solutions. You know, I, I look at what's happening now in states, and it's weird, because I love America. I don't think that flag over there is racist. I, I don't think that flag is something I should be ashamed of. I don't think it's something I should not celebrate. And by the way, if you're going to the Olympics, you should fly the flag and be proud of it, or you shouldn't be on the Olympic team representing the United States of America. I look at that flag and I see prosperity and I see freedom and I see excitement and I see something that I'm proud of. And we have an administration that says, don't be proud of America, that includes energy. Right. They want you to believe that you are an evil person if you are in a sector of oil and gas. They want you to be shunned, they want you to be shamed in your community. What I know is, is that we need energy independence so that we aren't on a leash from other nations. Exactly. And I go back to states. You look at states now, and it's almost like states have to start acting like they're little mini countries defending themselves and their rights because this administration is attacking their rights in their states. So how do we do that? Well, we've got to stand up to what's going on in, in Washington, and it's awesome to have states that are willing to, to take that fight on. We need companies to take that fight on as well. We need every individual. We have to realize that the fight at hand is to, for every American, wherever you're at, wh whatever, what's going on. You know, we are a nation of the people, by the people, for the people. It's going to take everyone. And to realize the understanding that, look, the world's demand on energy is growing. That's actually a good thing. That's people coming out of poverty. The only question becomes, who's going to meet that need? Well, we'd rather have that need met by the United States of America. And so all the people who are bought into the, the green new delusion, um, it, it, we, we have to realize that, you know, when it comes to policy level in Washington, they're putting the clamps on pipelines in, in the U.S., but allowing them in Russia. So we're, we're uh, putting a tampers on the energy in the, in, in the United States, but then we're allowing coal plants in China. So, you know, this isn't about the environment. This is about control and about ceding our, uh, our authority in the world and our strength in the world to other and nations. And freedom in the world. If we don't produce what we need in this country, we are not a free country and we are beholden to another country. Just because you have the price go up here or you shut down a pipeline doesn't mean that the need disappeared. That's what I try to tell you about the Keystone Pipeline is if you're so against it, you do know a pipeline is gonna be built somewhere else in the world and we're gonna buy that exact same product from them and someone else is going to prosper in their nation while we are hurting in our nation. I would argue that's un-American. Yep. Well, I, I do have good news. And one thing about CPAC is we're about solutions. And there are solutions. Everyone in this room, everybody watching has investments. And the problem is, is their money's been weaponized against them. $14 trillion was divested by Wall Street from the fossil fuel industry in the past decade or so. And not only that, if you own index funds, they might be with BlackRock and Larry Fink. And Larry Fink and BlackRock have been voting shareholder proxies so that they put three directors on the Exxon Mobil board that say we hate fossil fuels and they should be eliminated from the face of the use should be eliminated from the face of the earth. Exxon Mobil, three directors. The solution is people can weaponize their money. They can stand up, take their money out of BlackRock and they can put it in investment funds that believe in the future of America, that believe in energy and we can do that right now. I mean, that is something we can do. Tell Wall Street, no, stop this nonsense. It's funny you bring up investing. I think AOC, uh, she was talking about this the other day, that she wants to hold 
CEOs accountable if they do things that she says are against American values. She also talked about weaponizing the left. Uh, it, it, there's only seems to be one capitalist in the Democratic Party, and that seems to be Nancy Pelosi's husband, who apparently is really good at insider trading and not getting in trouble for it. I kind of want that guy's job for a day. Uh, <laughs> But you look at where we are right at this moment, and I do see a massive opportunity in the midterm elections where you can connect. And I, I, I think we have to sell this better than we have before, folks. I really I mean this. We have to look at voters in the eyes and say, what were you paying at the pump? This is voting economics. Do you want to stay on a course where you keep paying these prices and we're propping up our enemies? which I, again, argue is un-American policy, anti-American policy, or do you want to have independence as a nation and pay less at the pump? Is that a winning strategy? I'll go to you first. Yeah, the thing that we have to realize, it's the strength of the American energy industry. You can paint a direct line to the strength that President Trump had to sit down and make trade deals or to make middle, historic Middle East peace agreements that came out of the strength of the American industry being able to sit there and, and, to, and to sit at the negotiating table and bargain out a position of strength. And we've got to realize, you know, as the American people, that, that these energy prices that are going up while the inflation's causing our dollar to be less affects these homes in a way that's, uh, that's dramatic. And we've got to be able to sell that case and, and get the energy industry to understand these people who've profited off of the free economic system that we have in America to realize that these ESG scores eventually lead to, as we see in China, to these social personal scores. Uh, and, and this is a Marxist movement that's got to be pushed back against, and we've got to be bold in standing up and doing that. Lastly, I'll ask you this. On, on a state's rights issue, we got to fight these battles at the state level. We don't have the votes in D.C. yet. Hopefully, with the midterm elections, we're going to be able to change things. What do people need to do in their state to make sure that their elected officials understand and the strategy they should be using to make sure they understand that this policy is not okay with the people where we live? Well, stand up and stand up with their money and stand up with their votes. You know, I have the same vote as my 18-year-old daughter, uh, but I have more money than she does. And so we need to make it known that we're going to stand for this. So it, at every level, this is, this is a state's rights issue. Energy is not in the Constitution as a federal issue. This is a state issue. Why don't you say that again? Energy is not in the Constitution as a federal issue. That's reserved to the states. You would think that the, the, this administration would understand that, right? Or the judges that say we're going to shut down Keystone Pipeline. Do you guys think that the Keystone Pipeline is going to be a legitimate lawsuit that could have real legs? I certainly hope so. Uh, you know, what the Biden administration's done is, is a direct attack against the American people. It's a direct attack against the American strength as a nation. And we need to have a court system, a judicial system, that'll stop kicking the, the puck away from themselves and, and take these cases up and, and really weigh for the American people. As a taxpayer, I rarely root for our tax dollars to have to be paid out in a settlement. But this is one I would love for them to get every single dime to send a message that you can't shut down commerce this way just because you have a radical agenda in the White House. This is not how America works. This is private property rights, and the government should not be stealing our property rights. Give a big round of applause to my panelists on energy sector. I think they gave us a lot of info. Thank you, guys. So how many of you guys have a gun? Oh, I knew I was safe. I knew I was safe. We're going to talk about the Second Amendment right now. And I'm going to bring out for you Representative Andy Biggs, Arizona, and State Rep Matt Shaver from Texas. Come on out. I like the tie, sir. Twice in one day. That doesn't happen much at CPAC, my friend. So uh, I know a few things about guns. I own a gun store. I own a gun range. And if you ever come to Memphis, Tennessee, I have a barbecue restaurant inside. So come on out and eat barbecue, and I'll let you shoot a machine gun. That's America right there, my friends. That's America. So the Second Amendment is something, I started this gun range. A lot of people may, 
probably don't know this. I was in a uh, shooting several years ago. It was a gang initiation. And they call it having blood in the gang where a younger gang member is getting in the gang. And they go with an older gang member. I say older, like one's 21 and one's 18. And you murder someone. And you do it so that if you ever get caught doing a crime, or if you ever want to get out of the gang, or someone ever tries to turn you to narc, you won't cooperate with the feds because they will then tell on you where you murdered somebody. It's a pretty brilliant business move if you think about it. It's a little messed up, but it's pretty brilliant, right? They're going to make sure that no one works in the feds, no one narcs. So I was a target. Best friend and I got out of a car. We were standing there saying goodbye, and two guys came up, drew guns, and it was pretty much on. I had a gun to protect myself. I was able to shoot back, save my life. I tell you that story because it's exactly the reason why I opened a gun range and a gun store. I wanted every law-abiding citizen that I could get my hands on to be taught how to protect and defend themselves and do it in a safe manner. We now see the Second Amendment under attack. We see a Biden administration that's saying we're going to come after you. See, now in New York City, they're actually saying that you can sue manufacturers of guns if you're involved in the crime, which is insane because no one will be able to ever build a gun again. It'd be like saying, you drunk drive and we're going to charge Budweiser and we're going to charge the company that made your tires and the company that had your, your car with a crime as well. You, you, guns would cease to be built. No one could handle that litigation. You see what's happening right now, and it's very clear. This administration, I would argue, is more aggressive than any other administration in history coming after guns. How are we going to stop it? Well, the... The first thing to understand is uh, Mr. Chipman, who's been nominated to be the head of the ATF, David Chipman. This guy is the most anti-gun, anti-Second Amendment nominee for this position in the history of this country. And so what the Freedom Caucus did, myself and the Freedom Caucus, we have lobbied the Senate to stop that guy. So you have to, first thing you have to do is stop the guy that's going to enforce the laws, and that's Mr. Chipman. So that's... So we're fighting him. He's not going to get a nominee. He's, his nomination is going to fail. The second thing that you have to do is we in Congress, um, we're in the minority right now, but we continue to introduce legislation, things such as, as uh, regarding liability. There should not be liability on, on uh, the implementation of, uh, of the manufacturer, right? There should not be liability on the manufacturer if if they've manufactured the gun correctly. That is on the user. The user must share, must take all of the responsibility if they've misused the gun. So, so we're legislating. The third thing that we have to do, we have to have lit litigation. When President Trump was uh, in office, he was sued on virtually every policy he attempted to initiate. And they would shop for a judge who would issue a nationwide injunction on that policy. We need to do the same to Joe Biden and his administration. And, the, and then, then the fourth thing that you have to do is, this administration backs down, we've seen it. They back down when the voice of the people rises up as one and condemns their bad act, uh, policies. That's what we have to do. We have to gin up enough voices, loud and clear, so that the Biden administration knows that this is a political liability to them. They will back down. You, you look at conservative states, and, and one cause and effect there is of the left going after guns is we've seen constitutional carry that has been rolled out in so many great states, including Texas. I would argue it took too long. We got it in Tennessee now. I, it took a little bit too long, but you guys had to wrestle with this because there was a lot of pressure from a lot of people in law enforcement that said, look, we need to know that a guy has a gun in the car if they're a good guy or a bad guy, and having that permit helps us. How did you guys figure that out in the legislature here? You put your faith in your fellow law-abiding citizens. You start there. Uh, you ignore what the media is saying. Uh, and when you look at what some of the law enforcement groups were saying, not all of them, because I can tell you out in East Texas, my sheriff came down and testified in favor of constitutional carry. These same law enforcement groups that say, we can't let you have that freedom, 
are the same groups that are not going to be able to respond to even a serious 911 call nine, ten minutes. So who is the first responder? It's the individual citizen is the first responder. And so to your point, when you put your faith in law-abiding Americans, they're going to get it right. And then they're going to make the decision on how to protect their family because it is a God-given right to defend yourself. And the modern tool for that is a firearm. And so this is not something that the government can take away. The government should stand there to protect that right, not to Shall not be infringed. It. Shall not be infringed. Yeah. They forget that part. Shall not be infringed. I, you know, I think there's a blessing that has actually come out of defund the police. We've seen it. Gun sales have seen it. People realize that when you have a police department that's six, seven, eight hundred, nine hundred police officers down, a thousand down, eighteen hundred, two thousand police force that are walking away while they're defunding them. You look at New York City, you look at the knife attacks, the stabbings on the street, things are happening in Minneapolis. You look at Portland where they're setting up new countries and are allowed to have lawlessness and no one is stopping them. When you can burn police cars, jump on top of them, twerk on police cars and get on TV for it and no one arrests you like we saw two weeks ago on TV and burn down police stations and no one gets arrested for that. They didn't realize how many people that maybe were a little bit, nah, I don't know about guns, who said, screw this, I'm going to buy one. Not only am I going to buy one, I'm going to buy ammo and learn how to use it. I don't think they had any idea what they were going to do when they defunded the police. As American citizens finally said, I'm not taking a risk with my family anymore. I'm going to get a gun for the first time. First time home, uh, gun buyers in this country are outpacing first time home buyers, they say. <laughs> think about that number right now. It's incredible. No, that's exactly right. So. I am proud to be from Arizona, probably the earliest uh, cons constitutional carry state. We've been that way for a long time. And uh, my, in my hometown, you may not like this, but I do, it's, it's the only place I know of where you have a, a, a gun range with a little cocktail lounge right off the gun range. <laughs> so after you're done shooting, you can go relax in there. That's really nice. Look, America... Americans understand that police officers, they, they want to get there, but they're far away. If you're in a rural area, they're real far away. And if you live in a suburban area or an urban area, they're still going to be late to the game. And the police officer is going to be there, hopefully to catch the bad guy running away or whatever. They're not going to interdict. They're not going to prevent. So the reason that that we get to carry guns is because the founders understood very clearly they didn't give you that right. That's a God-given right to defend yourself. That's God-given. What the founders of this country understood, though, was they were going to recognize that right like it had never been recognized in any other country in the history of the world. We can't, let that we can't let that go away. If we're going to be a free nation, if the First Amendment's going to be invoked, and that's the things that allow us to get together, to speak, to worship, you got to have that Second Amendment. And it has to be there, and we're never going to give it up. And so they need to know. The other side has got to know. And we got to let the Biden administration know, because they're, they're coming after you. They're coming after you with executive orders. They're not bringing it through Congress. They're coming after you with executive orders. You're playing a game of chicken in Congress, obviously, on this issue. I have been an advocate for tougher gun laws. Let me explain what I mean by that. Don't freak out. I'm talking about when you commit a crime with a firearm. I'm in favor of that gun law being very tough on you, that you actually go to prison. Where is the Freedom Caucus on an issue of having federal minimums that are actually real, where if you commit a crime with a firearm, we're actually not talking BS games. We're not going to let you plea out and get a deal. If you narc or turn on somebody else, we're going to rush you through the system quickly. You're not going to go to trial. Why can't we get something that's just straight up, this is it. You commit a crime with a gun, and you go to prison, period. Okay, so... I want to make this really clear. I'm not going to disagree with you, but I am going to clarify something. Number one, there are too many duplicative federal crimes. 
there are over 40,000 federal crimes, okay? Most states can adjudicate what should be a crime in their state, not the federal government. And that means... And I agree, but if you're in Chicago or New York, you can burn down a police station and AOC raises money to get you out of jail. Yeah, the vice well, president right. does, for that's that right. matter. That's right. But here's the, here's the thing. Do you want to make a homicide in where there's no, there's no transversing of any kind of state boundary? Do you want to make a homicide in Chicago a federal crime and turn it over to the federal DOJ? I don't. Federal court system? I don't. And the federal juries that are going to be sitting there? I don't. That should be up to that local jurisdiction. And if, they, if you want a mandatory minimum, doggone it, they're the ones that should do it because it's in their communities. That's so, me. So, and, I, and I agree with that in principle. I do. I, this is why I love having these conversations. I agree with that in principle. But when you see cities that are being run by these anti-American socialist Democrat leftists, who have no problem with criminals walking out of a courtroom after committing heinous crimes. You ask yourself at that point, what do we have left? So you're a state guy, right? You're dealing with the state laws. What do you do then to, 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 to compensate for the lack of what is actually happening when they get charged? Ben, I don't think the problem is the law. I think the problem are the judges and, and, the, DAs. and the DAs who are bought and paid for by George Soros. Okay, we have seen this happen over and over and over again when you have district attorneys to just say, you know, we're, we're just going to not prosecute all of these types of crimes. Is our DA problem as bad as school boards? And I'm saying, as school boards, is it, is, is it bad that you have these activists that are running now it is, nationwide who have just said, screw the law and what it says, I'll do whatever I think will get me elected. And the school boards, we see these activists have said, this is my stepping stone to socialism and these Republicans are too stupid to be paying attention to what we're doing, and we're going to own this school system and indoctrinate an entire nation in one generation. It, it's true in the big urban areas. Out in the mid-size and rural areas, we still have strong judges and strong district attorneys. But they are putting massive amounts of money into winning races for district attorney in places like San Antonio and Austin. They have taken those two spots. And now those district attorneys just say, you know what, low-level narcotics? We're not even going to prosecute them. Oh, but we're going to start prosecuting police for stuff that we never prosecuted them uh, for before. So you can see the direction it's going. Just real quick on that. In 2018, George Soros put money in eight district attorney, county attorney races around the country, those prosecutors. We lost seven of those. The only one we kept was Maricopa County, which is my county. But... That's where they're going because they have an agenda with regard to law, and you get it from uh, defund the police, but it's also don't charge. It's also um, no, no bail to be released, those types of things. That's what you're saying. It's lawlessness, and we're rule of law people. That's how you have freedom. Thanks. Give a big round of applause, Representative Annie Biggs and Representative Schaefer. Thank you, guys. So last one, we're going to deal with big tech. Please give a big round of applause to the AG, Louisiana, Jeff Landry, and Representative Ken Buck. Come on out. So you guys may have heard there was a little lawsuit that uh, was announced, a class action lawsuit by a guy named Donald Trump <laughs> against big tech. Might be joining in that lawsuit as well. Uh, <laughs> you guys, uh, let's rewind a little bit. Uh, many of you, how many of you were at CPAC down in Florida? So when we were there, I did a discussion about big tech censorship. I got on the plane, I landed, and my Facebook page of 1.2 million people have been shut down for, ready for this, inauthentic behavior. Apparently, I'm not Ben Ferguson. It's the only thing we can figure out. We're trying to get birth certificates, figure this thing out. Literally speaking out at CPAC, got us silenced. That was it. You don't talk out against us. We shut down the president. We'll shut anybody we want to do. 
We have a government that clearly loves us. We now know there's coordination between Democrats and California elected officials giving names over to big tech saying, shut that person down. Oh, this one's annoying me, shut this one down. We're now hearing that there are people in Congress and aides that have been giving names to people at different organizations saying, hey, silence this guy, turn this one off, turn this lady off. How do we fight back when we're supposed to be the freest nation in the world? My thoughts, if they offend you, you don't have to follow me. This is not about obscene behavior. This is about, I believe something that you don't agree with, and you decide that I need to be silenced, and everyone around me silenced because I say something that you don't like, and that's exactly what Big Tech is doing right now. Tough, tough question. <laughs> You're supposed to have the answer, my friend. So I, I tell you, my view is um, if we had five Googles and seven Facebooks and 10 Twitters, we would be in a lot better shape than if one organization can shut you down. I agree with that. And it all comes down to the antitrust laws. Now, I'm not saying we, we should have an all of the above strategy. We should make sure that we're dealing with Section 230 and censorship. We should deal with the privacy laws. But the bottom line is we have to make sure we have competition in a marketplace that does not have competition. And so the, the bills that are going through Congress right now, both on the House side and the Senate side, bipartisan bills. Look, the Democrats hate these organizations uh, for different reasons than we do, but they hate them Explain also. Explain the politics of that, because this is a weird moment in American history where Democrats actually hate big tech, which I don't understand why, almost as much as Republicans do, but for, like you said, a different reason. What is their reason? I'll take them. They can be useful idiots to me on this one. I'm fine with that. But what is their reasoning? So they hate big. They hate success. We all know they hate success. They, 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 they want to make sure that our kids hate success, and so they try to teach that in schools. They hate success in all forms except for their own political, personal gain. But on our side, we want to make sure there's competition. We want to make sure that people can pull themselves up by the bootstraps and be successful. And we want to make sure that we aren't censored. But, but understand something. The Democrats will whisper. They're afraid of that censorship, too, because what the, what the big tech companies are doing to us today, they realize could be turned around on them tomorrow if, if they start attacking in a different way. In your state, you, they've been, you guys have been leading on this for a while now. Uh, we see Governor DeSantis leading on this issue as well and many other governors. Yeah, I knew that name would, I knew that name would get some applause in this room. What was you alls strategy early on, and how are you adapting? Because, they're, look, they got the best lawyers in the world. They have billions of dollars to fight. They're, they're not afraid of taking on any lawsuit. I almost think that their lawyers probably smile and grin like, this is gonna be fun. How are you guys having any success on this? I think the way you have success is to sue them, and to sue them, and to keep suing them until we break them up. You, you know, I can tell you, I was, I was one of the AGs four years ago who rang the alarm bells way back then uh, when we could see what, what was coming. Uh, when you realize the power that these companies have, the amount of data that they're mining from consumers, what they're doing with that data, the way they are suppressing content. I mean, what has happened is that we, we no longer have a public square in a physical aspect. We have a virtual one. And it's one that they created. And what's interesting is that they run their information on a network that was basically built say built, well, not by Al Gore, right? It was built by the Wait, government. I thought actually. the internet was built uh, by Al Gore. That's right, you know. But when you think about it, they ran that infrastructure uh, on spectrum that was granted to them by the FCC. Uh, they, 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 they should be at a minimum, at a very minimum, they should be regulated at a minimum like a utility, okay? And then at, at the most, they should be broken up. And, and the reason is, is that the FTC has failed to do its job. Facebook should have never been able to acquire Instagram. They should have never been able to acquire WhatsApp. I mean, these guys in the, in, in 20, in the 2010s, big tech went on a buying spree that would have made Rockefeller and JP Morgan jealous. And our government did nothing. They did nothing to ensure that competitiveness was placed in the marketplace. And what, is that because we were asleep at the wheel, or is it because they owned the people that were watching them? Well, it was, it was because of two, two reasons. Number one, the FTC was completely asleep at the wheel, and over the last decades, we've allowed the courts, which is a huge problem in this country, uh, we've allowed the courts to fashion out of whole cloth 
a consumer welfare theory that was never inside the textual context of Sherman. Now, I don't believe, again, I don't believe that we should dispose of an economic analysis, but to basically force a federal judge to be an economist is kind of, I mean, look, economists and meteorologists are probably in about the same book, right? They get it right maybe 50% of the time. And so to think that a judge could go out and do a pure economic analysis and determine, well, we're going to break this company up because, or not break it up because I believe that it's going to save consumers somewhere down the line is ridiculous. And so we are where we are because of that, because the FTC didn't do its job, because we didn't allow, we allowed these mergers and these acquisitions to, to happen, and because we allowed the courts, as they have done, uh, to basically write law in. And so hopefully Congress will clear that up for us. Representative Buck, you know, it's not just Facebook and Twitter now that's silencing people. We're also seeing Google damage businesses that they believe are businesses that should not be supported. Uh, I, as I said earlier, I own a gun range. We have a barbecue restaurant. The barbecue restaurant somehow got connected to the gun range in the Google world. You go look at our reviews right now, we're stuck at about 112 reviews. You know where we were a year ago? About 112. We went on the radio and I said, everybody right over you that's listening right now, none of them showed up. If you don't exist on Google as a company, do you even exist? How do you take on Google? Because Google's, I, 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 they've kind of slid under the radar screen here. But if you are a certain type of business, if you're an outdoor store, if you're sporting goods, if you are anything related with the Second Amendment, you don't exist and you can watch them throttling you where you can't show up as a business when people do basic searches. I think that's something we have to start taking on as well. So the, the, when we look at cable news, we've got a variety of sources of news to, to watch. And we know that, that they're biased. We used to, it's getting a little shady now. Yeah. We know they're biased, but, but, but they don't censor. And right. if you look at newspapers, they may be biased, but they don't censor. The problem is that Amazon can decide that your book doesn't get sold. And because they or hold- Or your t-shirt, or your American flag. Absolutely. And because they have such a, a, a grip on the marketplace of, of digital marketing, it, it, it dramatically affects uh, sales. The same thing with Google. Google changed its algorithm and disadvantaged Donald Trump and advantaged Joe Biden six months before the election. They moved tons of votes in the process of, of doing that. Facebook, Twitter, uh, Apple, they, they all are monopolies and they are using their position to, to put further their values and hurt our values. Is there an appetite in DC to actually break them up? Because, and I'm not saying you personally, but I'm saying you guys, Congress, they love cashing those checks coming from Silicon Valley. Yeah, so I took a pledge not to take any money from those four monopolies. That should get a really big round of applause, by the way. Madison Cawthorn, who was out here, took that pledge. A number of Republicans have taken that pledge. And, uh, and that has to grow. That, that just has to grow. But, but the bottom line is that we need to make sure that these companies don't control the marketplace and the political, as, as we were talking about, the public square. We're, we're seeing something else. How many of you guys listen to podcasts? There you go. So if you listen to a podcast, please write a review for the podcast that you love. I say this on behalf of all of us that do this for a living in the podcasting world because we have now seen in the last few months something new happening in the radio world. Podcasting, if you post your podcast out there and people Google, they have a hard time finding it. We're seeing it change in the algorithms and the ratings. We're now seeing where people will put in a name and they can't find your newest podcast episode that comes out. That's manipulation of the marketplace, I would argue. Is there any way to rein that in as well? Look, I think that right now, the state of Texas is leading, General Paxton is leading, we have joined in a suit against Google. And, and, and that suit, I believe, is part of peeling back the onion. It's part of Google's dominance in the ad tech world. 
uh, which is the start, which determines, they get to determine whether what you pay for in the digital advertising space, whether they'll give it to you, whether they'll give it to you compared to at a different cost. I mean, the things that Google is engaging in, in basically a ad tech world, and the way that they're buying and selling digital advertising, and again, they own the whole space, would literally, if we did it, say like in the Chicago Mercantile, right, or in the, um, in a NASDAQ, if we tried to control business in that fashion, they would send us to jail, and yet Google is allowed to get away with this. So I believe that the way we do it is to continue to bring litigation up front to demand from Congress that they clarify or reinstate Sherman. I think that some of the things that Congress Buck has done, uh, certainly the venue provision that y'all just got out of committee, which is going to arm attorney generals around the state with the ability to sue big tech in their states, right, instead of being able to send it to Silicon Valley where they have bought those judges off. And so gives us an opportunity uh, to basically break them up. And I think that eventually, uh, if, we, um, if we stand firm, that we'll prevail. You know, I, I say this to each and every one of you out there. If, if you have a business as mom and pop, if you have a local gun store, gun range that you go to, if you have a podcast, any conservative out there, please support them, not just with your dollars, but support them with your reviews, support them with their downloads, support them with writing positive things about them online, because so many times what we see is mom and pops in this country that get attacked by big tech, whether it's a baker in Colorado or a gun store in California, and if we don't stand up for them, they will close their doors. We have to vote with our dollars, but we also have to support them and advocate for them. You know, uh, Father's Day, I'll end with this. We tried to buy billboards to bring dad to shoot for free and have family memories. Not a single billboard company in Memphis, Tennessee would let us buy a billboard. We were too controversial. We called the local three TV stations. They would not let us buy an ad if it showed a gun, a bullet sound, or a casing. So now we basically can't, and we cannot advertise on social media. They won't take our ads either. They're literally trying to put us out of business because we advocate for the Second Amendment, which is why I say, if you have people that you support, they're conservative businesses, advocate and support them because they are coming after all of our rights and all of our freedoms. Well, here, here's what I'll tell you. I'll tell you the answer is right here in this room. And it is to continue to push your legislators and your members of Congress to stand up for you. I can tell you in Louisiana, we stood up against Bank of America and Citigroup when they went out and said they were no longer gonna extend credit to gun owners and gun manufacturers. And we said, if you're gonna put those policies in place, then you are not gonna do business with the state of Louisiana. And, and so I believe that the answer is right inside of each one of our states. And so again, I think that by standing up and forcing our legislators and our governors, like like great, like what Ron DeSantis has done, oh my God, it's just been unbelievable what he's done. Open it really up a is. can of whoopee I mean, oh, yeah. and let's I mean, go to just, town. Yes, I mean, all you want is, you want those governors to take those playbooks and bring them state by state by state. Because guess what? It's the states that created this country, not the federal government. We'll end on that note. Give a big round of applause to these guys. Thank you guys, a lot more coming up. I'll see you soon.
and welcome to the fourth annual Japan Conservative Union Conference.